Just first of all, to uh, provide a little bit more color around Casio as a company, we are uh, an oncology-focused biotech. We do nothing but de development of new cancer therapies. We have two main programs in the pipeline, both in human trials. And between these two programs, we expect to generate uh, four significant clinical data readouts over the next 12 to 15 months. So these are both ongoing studies that are going to be generating really quite meaningful clinical data in, in the near term. And I'll talk in a little bit more detail about these programs uh, just as we move through the presentation. But, uh, but I think the highlight, the flagship program, is our brain cancer program, GDC84. And this was actually licensed in from Genentech, uh, a very successful US biotech company, about 18 months ago. So it has the, the pedigree and the expertise of Genentech behind it, and uh, I think some, some really exciting potential as a new brain cancer therapy. Just a brief note on our strategy as a business, because we do think we're a little different from most Australian biotechs. We're not a company that's uh, formed around one particular piece of intellectual property. Our strategy is to look for really good quality assets that have been typically developed in a big pharma company, but have been deprioritized for their parent companies. And, and that's a common occurrence because big pharma companies have to focus their efforts. And, uh, and, and we believe that we can bring in some of those opportunities, build value around them through conducting clinical trials, and then look to partner them out for commercialization. So our Genentech asset is a really, really good example of that strategy in practice. We have a, a very lean team, but a very experienced team, a board of just four directors, all with significant pharma and biotech experience. My own experience, as Scott touched on, is that I'm a physician by training, and after a brief career in consulting, I moved into pharma. And I've worked the last 15 years or so with a couple of big pharma companies, mostly in Singapore. We have a, a scientific advisory board uh, who are internationally credentialed and, and provide incredibly valuable uh, expertise and connectivity for us. And then we have a very, very lean management team. We work on a very outsourced basis, so we, we try to keep our running costs really low. Um, I've shown here the, uh, the, the pipeline of the company as it stands, GDC84, our brain cancer program, and then Cantrixel, our ovarian cancer program. And as you can see here, uh, both of these programs currently in clinical trials, both of them with some, some uh, value-driving clinical data readouts ahead. And uh, we think that these will really help us to uh, show the value of our pipeline as, as we move forward over the next 12 months or so. So I'm going to dive in a little bit to the brain cancer story here because I say this is probably the, uh, the main value driver in the company at this stage. And the particular form of brain cancer that we're targeting is a disease called glioblastoma. And this is the most common and the most aggressive form of brain cancer. It's a disease that's been in the news very much uh, lately because it's uh, sadly the, the illness that, uh, that uh, affected John McCain in the United States. And, um, and it, it remains uh, one of the most challenging forms of cancer to treat. There's been really no significant progress in this disease for about the last 12 or 15 years. With best available care, life expectancy is about 12 to 15 months. And so this is really the very definition of an unmet medical need. It's a disease where there's a, a desperate need for new therapies. The only real drug treatment that's available for patients with this form of brain cancer is a drug called temozolomide. And temozolomide uh, was originally made by Merck, and it was, uh, it was a billion dollar drug in its day. It's now lost patent protection. But the issue with temozolomide is that it only works for about one third of patients. And for the other two thirds of patients, there is really no effective drug therapy available. And so our plan with GDC84 is to target the two thirds of patients uh, for whom there is no available treatment, the two-thirds of patients that won't respond to temozolomide. And uh, as I say, that's uh, a population that, that really uh, is crying out for new therapies. I'm going to jump ahead here just to, to say a very, very brief word about the science of the drug, and I, I won't labor the point here, but GDC84 is a class of drug known as a PI3K inhibitor. 
And the important thing about PI3 CAN inhibitors is that it is a known and proven and validated mechanism of treating cancer. There are two FDA approved therapies in the PI3 CAN inhibitor class. They're shown here on the slide, one from Gilead, one from Bayer. And uh, so we know that targeting PI3K works, to put it simply. The distinguishing feature of our drug is it's the only PI3K inhibitor that will get into the brain. We know that most drugs don't cross the so-called blood-brain barrier. They, they don't get into the brain, and they're therefore very poor at treating brain diseases. And indeed, both of the drugs shown on this slide, the Gilead and Bayer drugs, do not enter the brain. They will never be brain cancer drugs. But our drug does. It was engineered by Genentech specifically to do that, and it does it very well. And so we're really, uh, we, we really have this, this unusual balance of a very well-tested, very well-proven mechanism, but a completely unique feature to our drug, which lends it to brain cancer treatment. Prior to our coming on board, Genentech conducted a phase one human study of the drug. And that study showed the drug to be uh, generally pretty safe and well tolerated. Our most common side effects are an increase in blood sugar and mouth ulcers. And both of these we think are pretty manageable side effects for a cancer drug. Uh, the Genentech study was done in, in patients with very, very advanced brain cancer. So these were really patients, sad to say, right at the end of the, their treatment course. So it's a little bit hard to draw much in the way of efficacy conclusions, but we did see some really good signals of potential activity here. We saw that in, in uh, about 40% of patients, it stopped the tumor growing. And in quite a large number of patients, it showed a, what we call a metabolic response. In other words, it shut down the biological activity of the tumor. And we think that if that sort of activity is replicated in a proper phase two study, then we would have a very, very viable commercial product coming out of this. So, and I've just shown here what that sort of response looks like. These are, these are PET scan images, so uh, they're, they're a little hazy, but you can see in the before images on the left, there's these very, very dark areas, that's tumor. And uh, I think you can see hopefully on the right-hand image in, in, in each case that that, uh, that dark area has, has lightened up considerably. And that's really what success looks like. That's, uh, that's a patient that's, that we believe is responding to therapy. So we've now started a phase two study. And uh, initially, we're going to be looking at trying to increase the dose of the drug. We're actually going to be targeting newly diagnosed patients. We think because they're fitter and healthier, they may be able to take a little bit more of the drug. So we're initially going to spend six to six, nine months doing that. We're then going to enroll 20 odd patients to look for efficacy signals. And then we, uh, we anticipate starting a larger randomized study to actually uh, seek approval for the, for the drug. So the important thing is this is a drug that is really in the middle of its clinical development. This is a drug that potentially could be on market within sort of three and a half to four years. And, uh, and which is going to be producing a lot of data readouts uh, initially over the next, a couple over the next sort of six months, 12 months, and then uh, throughout the course of, uh, of a randomized controlled study. So, so we'll get a lot of insights, a lot of opportunities to, uh, to talk to regulators, a lot of opportunities to talk to partners, and a lot of opportunities to show the value of the drug to investors. So I think just to conclude here, uh, as I say, we, we, have, uh, we have a really uh, exciting drug now that is in a phase two study. It's dosing patients. That phase two study is happening in the United States with really some of the world leaders in brain cancer. And we'll be seeing data, as I say, coming out, multiple readouts over, over the next 12 months. I'll just add a final uh, comment here on the brain cancer program. We've been focused on glioblastoma, this, this most common and most aggressive form of brain cancer, but we do see the potential to use the drug in other forms of brain cancer as well. And uh, just earlier this week, we were really excited to announce a collaboration with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in the United States. This is one of the premier children's cancer hospitals in the world. And they're going to be looking at our drug at GDC84 in a form of childhood brain cancer called DIPG. 
and uh, and uh, you know there's really no center in the world better place to do this sort of research than St Jude, and they're largely sponsoring the research. We're making a small contribution and 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 helping them with it, but they're really driving this work, and uh, and I think that that's going to be really really interesting to see if we can offer benefit in childhood cancer as well. We are exploring other opportunities to look at other forms of brain cancer too. And uh, as those, uh, those discussions, those collaborations materialize, I think that'll be a really exciting uh, upside for the drug uh, to, to share with people. So I'm just going to say, uh, speak for, for one or two minutes on the ovarian cancer program, and then I'll, uh, I'll pause and, and uh, open to questions. Our, uh, our second program is uh, Cantrixel, that's uh, being developed in ovarian cancer, and uh, I, I've shown a few, uh, a few background points for ovarian cancer here. At a high level, I think the challenge for ovarian cancer is that we treat it well initially, but there's a real problem around resistance and recurrence with chemotherapy. We can treat ovarian cancer well initially, but the disease comes back and it becomes resistant to chemo. And one of the reasons why we think it becomes resistant is the existence of these so-called ovarian cancer stem cells. And we believe that when we treat uh, ovarian cancer with chemo, it clears out most of the cells, but it leaves behind these, these, stem, these cancer stem cells. They cause recurrence of the tumor. And so Cantrixil is trying to target those ovarian cancer stem cells and, uh, and help with the problem of resistance to chemotherapy. We have a phase one study ongoing. Now, phase one studies are always primarily safety studies. We're really looking to understand how well we can dose the drug and what its toxicities may be. And that study is ongoing and will be reporting in the pretty near future. But we did get some early pointers back in June from that study. And although it was a very small number of patients, very early data, it looked uh, like there was certainly a signal of activity there. It looked like the drug was beginning to show some evidence of potential benefit for these patients. So we're going to be watching this really closely in the background, and we think this is a, uh, you know, a nice sort of upside around the, uh, the portfolio. So I think I'll, uh, I'll maybe just kind of conclude there, uh, perhaps just with a couple of, of final financial details about companies. As I mentioned, we're listed on the Australian Securities Exchange. We also have ADRs on NASDAQ. We have about a third of the stock held there on NASDAQ. We've got a market cap of about $20 million. As of 30th of June, we had $9.3 million in current assets, uh, comprising about $6 million in cash and then some receivables and prepayments and things of that sort. In addition, on our balance sheet, we hold uh, about 4.9% of the stock in another ASX-listed uh, company called Noxifarm, and that's potentially an asset that we can monetize at our discretion as and when we need to. So, uh, so we, we have uh, a certain amount of firepower to take this program forward. We're, uh, we're a pretty lean running business. And as I say, some, some really exciting value driving uh, data readouts over the next 12 to 15 months. So thank you very much. I'd be really thank pleased to take some questions.